Good morning, everyone. Ah, it is so wonderful to be standing here and not stuck in my office. Uh, the last two weeks were awkward. They were weird. At one point, I know many of you did notice this, but at one point last week, it was like about two-thirds of the way through, it, you may have seen, I just got very distracted. I was kind of just like, what am I even doing here? <laughs> Because it's like self-awareness, you know what I mean? Mike, you know what you're doing? You're standing in a room by yourself, imagining a group of people that are down the hall. It was so weird. It was very different from when we were all on Zoom, you know, and we were all sort of doing that, and I was sort of recording things. That was different. But man, oh man, it, 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 for just that, you know, few seconds, it got to me, and I couldn't bring myself back. I lost my train of thought. I mean, it was all over the place, so... I may even have just edited that right out of the YouTube video, so you won't see that little glitch uh, if, you, if you're watching on YouTube. But it is good to be up here, good to be seeing you face to face. Some of you I haven't seen here at worship in a long time, and it's just great to be together. Uh, and I, 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 do, I feel like we say this every week, but we are, it seems, on the track for things to get better. And so I think we can start you know, you're feeling a little bit more back to normal. So uh, just keep praying for that. And, and the prayer is not just, oh, I don't want to wear a mask anymore. The prayer is that this disease that does take people's lives will just be behind us. So let's pray for that. Let's be people who are concerned and compassionate in that way. Uh, but it, again, it will be good to, to see each other face to face, literally, and uh, to be able to experience that again. Glad you're here. We are here to offer up our praise to God, to extend from our hearts all those thoughts, all those things that we thought about even through the week. We get to sort of express that in song. We sang some of the most, you know, vivid imagery this morning. The, the songs were well chosen by Chad just for their wording and the way it describes some things. And uh, I appreciate that. And I always appreciate the songs we sing, but you appreciate it more when you can actually hear your brothers and sisters you know singing it and actually experience that i'm glad we got to have that a little bit more today and those of you who are joining us online we're glad that you got to be with us uh, in whatever capacity so before we begin the lesson let's go to the father in prayer dear lord we thank you for molding us and creating us crafting us for your purposes and we pray we can live those out lord help us to not have those purposes uh, subsumed and taken over by the enemy. Help us instead, Lord, to uh, live the way you want us to live, exactly that way, not adding to it, not taking away from it. Help us to live full lives that you've given us and, and enjoying all the gifts that you offer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with an analogy, and the analogy is this. Human beings are like scissors, all right? And I think human beings are like scissors in many ways, but I just want to talk about one particular way. If you were taken and transported back in time, all the way back to Babylon or, you know, the, the, the Mesopotamian era, area, and back, way, way, way back, Bronze Age and earlier, you would have been able to live and, you know, you would have recognized most things. Some things you would wonder, what is this tool for? I don't even know what to do with this. But there's one thing, the scissors, that you would have said, oh, those are scissors, because that's how old scissors are. They discovered very, very ancient scissors, and they trace it back to at least the Bronze Age, which means scissors, as an idea, are 4,000 years old. There are many ideas that have died in 4,000 years. Scissors are not one of them. And they changed a bit over time. These have Egyptian hieroglyphics on them, uh, used somewhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, then they start to look more like what we recognize till we get to present day. You notice about 2,000 years ago, they changed the pivot point for scissors, uh, which was a great change. It was revolutionary, and so now we use them slightly differently than they would have used them back in the Bronze Age. But scissors are a great design. It was barely improved upon in 4,000 years, and you are a great design that's barely been improved upon in 4,000 years. I, I don't say that we moderns are, you know, the pinnacle of creation. We're not. We're no different than Adam and Eve. 
but God had purposes for you, and they were excellent purposes. And his invention of the human being was a great one. Yeah, we have fallen, and we, we fall short, and sin really wrecked things. But this series has been delightful because I have been able to go back to the beginning. Let's look at the original purposes, what God put us together for. And that's what we've been looking at. We've been made on purpose. Why did God make you? He had very specific purposes in mind. We've talked about those first three. Sorry, that's cut off a little bit there on the wall, but uh, dominion, relationship, work. And today we want to talk about rest. And, uh, you know, it begin. well, okay, I want to begin with a passage that we looked at last week because I said that rest and work are really two sides of the same coin. You, you do not, you can't talk about one without the other. And this is one of the passages I mentioned last week, Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse 9, right? Verses 9 and 10. So it's not to 12, it's just to 10. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And we looked at this amazing passage in Isaiah about how, look, you were designed for the good work God gave you to do. And in fact, what the, the life God wants you to do is living in such a way that begins to repair some of the damage that's been done by sin and rebuilding some of the ruins of this world by the good work you're doing. Not just the, you know, the, the Christian type work you do, but all the work that you do. When you do it heartily and you're doing it for the Lord, he's going to use that to help this world be repaired rather than continue into ruin. And the idea here is we work and we pour ourselves out. But there's a problem with pouring yourself out, isn't there? When you pour yourself out, how do you refill that cup? You've got to get refilled. You can't keep pouring yourself out because when you pour yourself out, by definition, you are empty. You are toast. You are done. And that's where rest comes in. Many of you look at this and you say, ah, oh, Mike, now this is what I've been waiting for. You know, this is the sermon I've been waiting for. And in fact, I'm feeling a bit drowsy. <laughs> now, I know I say this to people all the time. This is antihistamine season, right? So you take that pill in the morning and by, by you know, 1130, you know, with the, a little bit warm in here, oh boy, you know, your, eye, your eyelids just feel, that's not the kind of rest I mean, all right? So don't, don't try to live out the sermon too early, too soon, right? Don't, don't, go, don't go straight to the application, you know, before we even get to the first point. But rest. You are made for rest. If you were made for work, then you are also made for rest. They are hand in hand. And God demonstrates that from the very beginning. He tells his people to rest. He tells them to. He commands them to do it. The fourth commandment says you're going to keep a day and you're not going to work. And they called it the Sabbath. The word Sabbath means cease, desist, or rest. Think about music, you know, when you're, you're, you're playing music or you're singing music and you come to that point and you see that particular symbol, you stop playing, you stop singing, it's a rest. That's exactly what the Sabbath is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a, a time where you cease what you're doing and pick it up later. It comes from, of course, the very beginning. Thus, this, we read this last week, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. I have so many questions about this verse. So many questions. First of all, did God get tired in this work? There are theologians who would faint from that idea. Of course not. Of course not. Yes, God could never get tired. God is omnipotent. He has all the strength he needs. Did God need to rest? What did that even look like? Does God have a couch that he kicks his feet up and, you know, turns on the television? What does it look like for God to rest? I have many questions, and the Bible doesn't answer them. It just says, trust us. God rested. He worked, and then he rested on this seventh day. And so the commandment that we find in Exodus reminds us of that. That dog, isn't he just so cute, right? Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day. This is from the Ten Commandments. 
keep, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. Remember, a cease, a pause, it's time you stop. A Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter. Sorry, side note here. I was thinking about how on the weekends people often will mow their lawns or take care of yard work. And I'll tell you what, it's kind of nice to have a teenage boy at those times because it's like, there's work for you to do this Saturday, you know. But on a Sabbath, you're, you're supposed to not even make your son work. I, I love that that little thing, don't, don't make your son or your daughter work. Uh, your male servant or your female servant, same thing, same thing in my household. Sons, daughters, male, female servants, all the same. Uh, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So it's taking this idea very seriously. So look, God worked for six days. He rested on the seventh. You will do the same because God made that day holy. He designated it. Okay? Now in Deuteronomy, we have the same Ten Commandments list. But I want you to see the subtle difference as to why. So in Exodus, you rest because God rested on the seventh day. Look for the reason why in Deuteronomy. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. This is all going to sound very similar. Six days you shall work and do all your work. You shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant, your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male, female, your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Interesting that in Deuteronomy, the reasoning is not because God rested on the seventh day. The reasoning is you came out of Egypt. You came out from endless labor. So now you rest. You and those who work for you deserve a rest. You need a rest. God saved you from endless drudgery, slavery, work, 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 work that was unfair, work that continually got worse and worse as the Egyptians put the pressure on you. So remember all that. Remember what you were saved from. Now that categorizes that Sabbath rest a little bit differently. Sort of categorizes it as a gift, a reward, or, or something that uh, you're doing in remembrance of what God has done for you. It's not simply, God made this holy, so you better not work. There's a little bit more to it. There's a little bit more fleshed out there. And so we get both reasons as we move through. Now, the first reason, the one from Exodus, God made this holy, we can't work on this day. That sort of became the driving force in the, in the decades and centuries after Moses, so that by the time we get to Jesus' time, the Sabbath day is so regulated. It is so specific what you can and can't do. You know what it's become? The Sabbath day has become slavery because of how burdened the people became. Jesus, of course, almost all of his big conflicts were over the Sabbath. He healed people on the Sabbath. His followers, as we'll see, grabbed grain on the Sabbath. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what, Jesus, what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. So the first thing Jesus says in answer is, you know there's exceptions, right? You know we have the law, but when somebody is starving, there's exceptions. He also would have said, look, when a man has a withered hand and I can heal him on the Sabbath, there's exceptions. I can do this good work. But here he continues. He says, so... Okay, wait, where am I? Here, okay. Verse 27, and he said to them, the Sabbath, this is the important part, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. 
So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So the first answer was there's exceptions, but the second one is you have misunderstood this rest that my Father gave to you for that seventh day. You've turned it into a yoke. You've turned it into uh, you know, this thing you have to be so stressed out about, so worried about. I better not do this. I better not do that. I better just, I, I better just sit on a stool the, the entire day. And it was supposed to be a gift. You weren't made to be put under these regulations. You were made to enjoy a time of rest because you need it. And so Jesus gives sort of God you know, direct explanation for what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. It was made for you that you might enjoy it, that you might rest, that you might have the opposite of work. You might rejuvenate. But, of course, there's a problem. There's always a problem, right? We're made for something, but then all kinds of things get in the way. And here's the thing. You don't rest very well, and neither do I. We are not good at it. Now, there may be some of you who raise your hand. Hey, Mike, I'm pretty good at it, all right? I have worked at this. I've worked hard at this. Uh, but trust me. Uh, there are ways we can improve. Now, what, these next few points, these are not scientific. These are not even, I, I take all these from Scripture. This is just what, look at my own life and looking at the lives of some of you. No names will be mentioned. One name from my family, but you don't, she's not a member here, so don't worry about it. Number one, the problem is we don't rest very well because we hate empty schedules. There's always more to do. Now, that doesn't mean that you always you know, plan to go somewhere else. It's that when you have a, a space of time, you say, oh, then I've got to do this in the house. I've got to do this around the house. I've got to take care of this, this, this. I've got to make sure I, I, I cut the grass. This is my only chance. I'm so busy. And a time that should have been rest is all of a sudden literally filled with work. Just the fact that you're not punching in you know, the time clock or you're not going into the office doesn't mean that, you aren't, that you're resting it means that you're probably just doing work of a different kind. But we hate empty schedules. We get guilty about empty schedules. And so we say, I've got to fill it. I've got to fill it with something. And sometimes I think we even fear empty schedules. Because if my schedule's empty, I might have time for reflection, which I'm going to get to in a minute. And I don't really want a lot of time for reflection. I actually noticed this about myself in the last couple of years because what I noticed was there were some losses in my family. I lost two aunts I was very close to. I lost my grandmother who I was very close to. And especially my grandmother was during the time of COVID, so it was so different that I, I didn't want time for reflection. Time for reflection would probably make me sad. It would probably, I, I would end up feeling this grief. And so I'd rather fill it with something else. I'd rather move on to the next activity. So sometimes we not, don't just hate empty schedules, we fear them because it might make us think about some things. Second thing, we plan rest times that exhaust us. This is another reason why we don't rest very well. We plan rest times that exhaust us. Now this is where I'm gonna mention my other aunt, my Aunt Renee. If you go on vacation with my Aunt Renee, she comes with a binder, okay? <laughs> Wherever you go. So let's say the whole family's going to the beach and the plan for most everybody is lay on beach, soak up sun, that's it. That's the plan, that's the whole plan. But not Aunt Renee, she comes with the binder. Now the binder is not binding, all right? You don't have to do all these activities, but she's gonna, she's gonna find places to go, things to see, let's go, let's move on to the next thing. And I actually like that. Other people find that kind of vacation exhausting. And some people might come back to work, and you've heard this before, I need a vacation from my vacation. I, I filled it up with all kinds of craziness, and I would rather have just you know, laid on sand and, and did some resting. The third thing we do, we seek escape when we rest, and that's really just numbing rather than resting. Now, people do this all kinds of ways, and the modern world, the, the current world, has given you millions of ways to just numb out rather than actually resting. Well, what's the difference? Well, take alcohol, for example. Some people, they, when they think weekend, 
They are thinking, when can I get drunk? When can I let go of all the responsibilities, give them to somebody else or whatever, so that I can numb out? I can just drink until I don't have all these anxieties and worries. I forget about them. I don't think about them. Or other people will you know, say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into video games. I'm going to jump into this. I'm going to try to just escape. And what ends up happening is it's not just local anesthesia, the numbing, you know, it becomes general anesthesia. You don't deal with the things you do need to deal with when you escape, when you're in the habit of running off and escaping. If there's a problem with my rest, it would be that third category for sure. And then number four, we refill our cups from the wrong sources. Times when we should be, as I said, refilling because we've, we've poured ourselves out in our work and the good things we did that week, but we go to a source that's either contrary to God's purposes or fills us with a bunch of garbage and it's not satisfying. And so you begin to wonder, well, why can't I get any rest? Why can't I feel like my time there was well spent? Well, it's because you went to the wrong source. And God says, I want to be your source. In fact, the Psalm 23 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He actually wants to rest you. He wants to give you the kind of rest that you need. And yet, we go to other sources. We go to the thief rather than the shepherd. And the thief just steals our time or, or fills our time with things that don't glorify God. So you and I, we don't rest very well. I know you enough to know that that's fairly true, and maybe, maybe you could add to this list of reasons why rest doesn't work for you. But we've got to find a way to rest as God intended us to. You see, God's idea of rest is pretty specific in Scripture. First of all, you need it. It's not optional. You know, rest isn't like, you know, if I have time, maybe I'll, I'll you know, calm down. I'll, I'll use some time for reflection. No, no, no. It, it doesn't depend on whether you get an opening. Your body will force it. You'll actually end up sick. And when, you, when you're sick, that's God's way of saying, guess what? You're going to rest for a while. I gave you a sickness. <laughs> you can't even go into the office. <laughs> right? I, I don't know if God chuckles like that, but... <laughs> Sorry, that may have been... Well, anyway, he, you can almost see him doing it, though, right? Because he, he knows what we need. He knows you need rest. So sometimes he'll bring certain cir circumstances and say, you're going to have to take a break, Mike. That was happening. This is a passage we read two or three weeks ago with Elijah. Remember, Elijah was at his wit's end. He was running from Queen Jezebel, and he was in like a... a the state he was in, I mentioned it as disconnected. He felt like there was no hope. He had nobody on his side. First Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die. Remember this? Saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And this is the part that I sort of skipped over because I, I went down to a, a later part in the chapter. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked and beheld, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So God's answer to Elijah being at the end of the rope, like at the, at the tattered end that he could no longer take, where the horizon had closed in on him, God said, How about lay down? Lay down for a while, rest. And when you wake up, I've made some cakes for you. Can you imagine what it tastes like to eat food prepared by angels? Yes, I can, because my wife is an angel. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. I said to somebody earlier today, uh, it's nice to get, you know, a, a chuckle here and there. But if you get groaning from people during your sermon, that means that somebody is listening. So that's good. I would have groaned as well. That's what God knew he needed rest 
food, drink, more rest, not only for the journey ahead, but for what you just experienced. So God knows you need it. It's body, mind, spirit, all of it. You need it. But God's idea of rest also involves this idea, that rest allows reflection on him. If your life is work, 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 you know what that's like. You know that if there's an especially stressful time at your work and it's long hours and it's that you know what it's like to be have no time left you know for spiritual reflection for time with god and god says that's what i want from you i want you to take some time each week to spend with me this psalm starts you know this, this section starts so beautifully with this command be still be still Calm down. I know it's good work. I gave it to you to do. I know the good work that you're, you're doing. The way that you're gung-ho for the objectives and all the goals and all the paperwork and whatnot. But listen, take time to be still. And when you are still, then you can know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. It's like God stills the psalmist, and the psalmist in turn says, and this is what I do know about him. Because I was able to calm down and remember, I can turn around and say, yes, the Lord of hosts is with us. That's a comfort. That's only a truth you come to upon reflection, taking time to think through it, think through things. Rest encourages simplicity. Simplicity is a goal we should all have. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the cares of the world, the, the standards of the world, the, you know, the stuff of the world should not be our primary focus, that we can set that aside and we can realize other things are more important. Uh, Jesus tries to tell them this in Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's the reason most of us are going to work in the first place. There's needs. You've got to be able to provide for your family. That's why I work from, you know, all you know, those five days a week or more, you know, in those eight hours or more per day, because I have these worries. I have these fears. But verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God will provide. He is a provider. He'll continue to provide. Rest means I'm not going to imagine or think that it's only my work providing those things. If I can take time to rest, that means I can trust in him, and I trust that he's still going to provide. It also might look like, you know, sitting around and not getting my house immaculate, because an immaculate house is an artificial construct, right? And if God wants me to rest instead, well, then the cobwebs can stay. You know, the, the vacuum can go unrun if what I really need is rest. Can I rest in that? Can I live a life that simple? That's a little bit different take on simplicity. But realizing priority, realizing that sometimes God wants me to simply sit Seek the kingdom and realize the rest will be coming from him as well. Rest reminds us that work does not define us. Ooh, that's a tough one. Isn't it true that when you meet somebody, that's almost one of the first questions. Oh, well, what do you do, right? Or if you're in school, what are you studying? What, do you, what work will define you later on, right? If it's not defining you yet, what, how will it define you later on? What do you do? There's a great book. I told Shauna, there's sometimes, there's sermons where you find a great book that you don't even own, but it would have been so perfect to have already read it for this sermon, but too late. But I'll, I'll eventually read it, and maybe we'll talk more about this another time. But this book is called An Unhurried Life, Following Jesus' Rhythms of Work and Rest, which is really interesting. He looks at Jesus' life. Do you realize how many times we see Jesus asleep? or taking naps, or going off by himself. It's a, remarkable in, in that, you know, really a, a short amount of time we have described of his life. For example, he's on the ship, 
and he just goes to sleep. And they're all, they're working. They're working the ropes. They're working the sails. And they're, they're you know, he's asleep. He's, he's totally content. But this is what he says about how work can define us. We err when we try to establish our identity through our work rather than realizing that our identity is shaped and strengthened in the place of Sabbath rest and then expressed in our work. Okay, so who you are is best understood when you're reflecting on who has made you his in his family. When you stop and reflect on that, that reflection then leads me out into the marketplace, into the workplace with a totally different attitude. I am not what I produce for this corporation. I am a child of God. That's different. That's a better way of understanding work and where I fit as far as my identity. It's what 1 John is trying to remind us. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And then he seems to want to add something to that. And so we are. The NIV puts an exclamation mark at the end of that, exclamation point at the end of that. Rightfully so. Stop and read that again. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. That's what we are. That's what you are to your core. You're a child of God. You're not a dental hygienist. You're not an auto repair person. You're not just a, a, a PR specialist, whatever. You're not just a caseworker, a librarian. I'm trying to look around and see what I know, you know, as far as what people do. You are a child of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. That whole passage is about identity. Finding our identity, who you are. And what you are now as a child of God, what you're going to be is glorious and we, we don't even see it yet. But know for now that you can rest in the idea we are his child. And that's, it, it's when I'm calmed down, when I'm still, that that truth come, washes over me. And I'm not deceived into thinking I'm just somebody who works nine to five. And finally, God's idea of rest involves the fact that rest is the foretaste of the life to come. Heaven is called rest over and over again. It was called that in our theme scripture from Hebrews. But over and over again, that's what it's alluding to. There is a time to come when the work will be done. The good work he has given you to do, whether it's in the chemistry lab or out there you know, counseling people or out there helping customers at a bank, but all the good work that he has given for you to do, one day it'll come to an end. And what you're going to look forward to then is rest. It's what Jesus made possible for us. He promised it. Come to me, he says, all who labor and are heavy laden. Labor with heavy burdens is what this life can be sometimes. When work is out of control, when we have so much on our shoulders, all who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Exchange the, the, the burden of work for the yoke now that is in Christ, where you're working for him rather than for the world. And he wants to give you rest. And he's provided not just rest now, but rest in the life to come. Revelation chapter 14. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. It's a blessing to come to the end of this work-filled life because there is true rest waiting for you. That's what it says. If your work life is lived under him, if your resting life was a way of filling up with him and his spirit and his goodness and his truth, if those things are true, well then, 
you have great things in store for you. Jesus has opened that door. God tells his people, look, I designed you not just to be working robots. I designed you for rest where you come and you spend time with me. You come to understand who I am. We don't do it very well, so we've got to relearn. We are always relearning how to do things right his way. And his way involves so much good news, resting the way he wants you to, spending time with him, letting our cups be refilled the right ways. It all begins with a relationship with his son that takes away the sin that comes like a brick wall and blocks you from his blessings and from the eternal life he wants to spend with you. Maybe today you need to respond to him and say, I don't want that barrier between me and the Father who wants to love me the way it's said in 1 John. If you need to respond to that, God, come as we stand and sing.